Here it is, monsoon season 2018. I'm Mike Farrington, welcome back to my shop, aka the boardroom. In this video, I'm gonna frame a mirror in three pictures. And this is a project that my wife specifically asked me to do, and she never asks for anything, so I thought I'd get on this and get this done for her. So I picked out two nice four-quarter cherry boards that I had laying around, and I got to work. Here I'm cutting a wedge off the side of this board, and this is an attempt to get the grain to run parallel with the edge. And it's always nice to have grain running parallel with the length of a board when you're making a frame or a door or something like that. If you have a two inch wide frame piece as I do in this project and the grain runs to one side or the other, it's very eye catching and not in a good way. But I don't take this overboard. When possible, I'll straight line an edge to get a better grain layout, but it's not like I'm gonna be throwing away wood over that. So as you can see, I like to bounce back and forth between the bandsaw and the jointer, and this is how I rough out my parts. I have them cut an inch or two long right now, and as I'm ripping off strips on the bandsaw, they're about 1 8 inch over. At this point, I have a bunch of parts stacked up that have been roughed out, and now I come back and I do a final face jointing and edge jointing, and then it's on to the planer for final thicknessing. And I know a project like framing pictures in a mirror is a simple project, but sometimes simple projects provide the best opportunity for learning. And anytime I have a small project like this one, I always try and pick something and work on it and try and improve my skills. And for this particular project, I wanted to try using a hollow chisel mortiser to cut through mortises. And hollow chisel mortisers are not known for leaving the cleanest mortises. So for that reason, anytime I'm doing through mortise and tenons, I use a router. But in this case, I wanted to try a new technique, so what the heck? And you'll see coming up in the video that I drill in from both sides, and this ends up creating a mortise that's plenty clean for a through mortise and tenon joint. We need to work on the shop apprentice's brooming technique. Right, all the milling's done, and now I have parts that are ready for joinery. And I always take a minute or two to orient the boards with their best face up. And my plan here is to cut through mortises so that the ends of the tenons are exposed on the outside edge of the picture frame. And I think this will add a subtle detail that will indicate that the frames were handmade without calling too much attention to the frames themselves and detracting from the pictures. And here I'm using my marking gauge to get the exact distance from the end. And then I transfer that mark to the other side and proceed to mark another line with a marking knife and square. And here's a quick pro tip. Drop the marking knife into your scribed line and then press the square up against the marking knife. And that will ensure that you have located your square perfectly. And I do this to both sides of the workpiece because I'm going to be using a hollow chisel mortiser and drilling in from both sides. And this helps prevent blowout. So I wheeled out the hollow chisel mortiser and got it all set up. And I don't know who designs these things, but they should make them about a foot and a half taller. All right, here's the reason for the marked lines, and that is I don't set up stops. I just work right to the marked lines. And I start by establishing the outer edges of the mortise, and then I just come back and drill out the waste in between. And once the first side is complete, I flip the workpiece end for end and do the same to the other side. After the mortises have been drilled, it's time to cut some tenons. So I get started by marking a line on all four sides of only one piece, and I only do it on one piece just to help me set up the table saw. 
After setting up the table saw, I proceed to cut some tenons. And this method that I'm using here is called the speed tenon. And you have to pronounce it that way or you're not saying it right. And some people say that this method is a little unsafe. I haven't found it to be unsafe. I think as long as you have a good amount of experience in front of a table saw, you'll be just fine. This method really does produce a nice tenon and it's easy to set up and it gives really good results, but it's not as fast as the name would imply. Um, I think going forward, I'm gonna come up with a new way to make tenons, either on my shaper or my sliding table saw or something like that. Oh yeah, and the gloves really help with grip when sliding the piece back and forth. At this point, the mortises are cut, the tenons are cut, but a little bit of fine tuning needs to be done. So I label all the joints and I get to final fitment. But before the final fitting, there's always time to play with the shop apprentice. Final fitting requires sharp tools and I needed to sharpen my half inch chisel. Here's a quick pro tip. When you re-grind the bevel on your chisel, don't grind all of the sharpened edge away. Leave a little bit of it. That'll save you some time when you're putting a new fresh edge on. I like to do my sharpening on water stones, and water stones occasionally need to be flattened. I recently picked up this new set of water stones. They're the Shapton Professional. And what I like about them is they don't need to be soaked. A lot of water stones need to be soaked for quite some time before sharpening these. Just need a quick spritz and you're ready to go. And as you can see, I have four stones here, uh, 1500 grit, 5000 grit, 8000 grit, and 12000 grit. And one day when I win the lottery, I will pick up the 30000 grit. So after flattening the stones, I smear some water around and I get going. All right, so here's how I sharpen a chisel. I start by putting the top of the bevel down first onto the water stone. Then I rock the chisel forward until the cutting edge is touching. And then I lock my wrists in place and I pull back using my knees and feet rather than my arms. And this helps keep the angle of the chisel consistent. And for us old blind dudes, a magnifying glass helps ensure that I have recreated that 8,000 grit pattern on the tip of the chisel. Once I'm happy that I've pulled any defects out of the tip of the chisel with the 8,000 grit stone, I move over the 12,000 grit stone. After a few passes on the front of the cutting edge, I hit the back of the chisel, and then I come back and hit the front one more time, and it's ready to go. So here's my check to make sure that I've done my job in sharpening the chisel, and that is if the chisel shaves the back of my hand nicely, it's ready to go. With sharp tools in hand, I'm ready to start touching up the tenons. The speed tenon method can leave a little stepping on the shoulders of the tenon, and usually it is very minimal. One or two or three passes with a shoulder plane cleans it all up. And I like to come in from both sides to prevent blowout. A couple of the tenons fit a little tight, so I would just take a couple of passes with the shoulder plane just to make the fit loose enough to put together without having to smack it together with hammers. And it's always a good idea to try and clean out that little inside corner there. Gunk can get stuck in there and create a little gap in your joint. And the final step is to clean out this little ridge created by the few passes that I made with the shoulder plane. And there's no harm in undercutting this, uh, just to make sure that there's no material preventing the joint from coming together. This process takes somewhere between three and five minutes per tenon, but the payoff is a perfect mortise and tenon joint. And here I'm just marking for a stop rabbit, or rebate, depending on which continent you're from. And this operation could be done with a handheld router, but in my opinion, it's much faster and easier on a router table. And here's the stop rabbit, and I make sure to overcut this a small amount so that I don't have to come back with a chisel and square it up after I glue the frames together. And 
And next I cut some slots for the wedges that I'm going to install during glue up. My, how the world has changed. A customer asked me to dispose of an old desk that they had. It was American made, probably from the 70s or 80s. This was the material they made the drawer boxes out of. Perfectly quarter sawn, perfectly clear walnut. Oh yeah, and the exterior of the desk? Red oak. So I cut a small chunk off of that drawer side and I made a few wedges out of it. So I planed the walnut to thickness and then I freehand cut this angle on a piece of quarter inch MDF and uh, makes for a great wedge maker. So I'm prepping for glue up here and I dress only the inside edges because I can get to all the other faces after everything's glued together. And even after planing, I like to sand. And I do this because I think modern finishes can stick to a sanded surface better than a planed surface. And next it was on to the glue up. And one of the cool things about wedged mortise and tenons is you don't really need to leave anything clamped up. I just clamp it in place, whack the wedges in place, and then take it out and let it dry. Remember earlier when I talked about cleaning the gunk out of the corners? Well, here's an example of where I could use to take a little of my own advice. While I was making these frames, I listened to an album titled Throwing Copper, and it's by the band Live. And I ended up listening to the album probably two or three times all the way through. And I've always been a big fan of that album since I first heard it way back in the mid-90s. And I have to admit, the local classic rock station started playing a couple live songs. And nothing makes me feel older than when I hear songs on a classic rock station that I was listening to when I was a young man. But time marches on, and it's nice to hear that some of those songs are being played on the radio again. For me, joinery really is the magic part of woodworking, and nothing brings me a greater sense of achievement than tapping wedges into a through mortise and tenon. It just gives such a feeling of quality and permanence. When building the mirror, I built it the same exact way as I did the picture frames, but I wanted to add a small shelf to the mirror so that I could display, I don't know, a little vase or something. I'm not sure what I'll put there. Um, so what I ended up doing was just ripping a quarter inch off of the top of the bottom piece, and then I made this little shelf that has a rabbit. I spent the better part of a lunch break thinking about how I was going to glue and clamp this shelf in place. And I ended up just deciding that glue and nails would be easier than glue and clamps. So that's what I ended up settling on. And I just used half inch 18 gauge brads and uh, plenty of glue. Prior to nailing the shelf, I added a small rabbit to help hold the mirror in place. After everything was good and dry, I came back and cut off the leftover bits from the through mortise and tenons. And then I moved on to surface prep. I planed all of the edges and faces and then gave them a quick sanding. Watch the clouds on the left side of the screen and you'll see why I shut the camera off and ran into the basement. Nearly soiled myself when I saw that. At this point it was time to apply some finish and I decided to go with Osmo. And Osmo claims to be a hard wax oil. So I don't know what that is, but it seems to work pretty good. And I like using Osmo for two reasons. The first reason is it feels really nice to the touch after it's dry. 
And second and most important is Osmo is one of the least yellow finishes I've run into. If you look at Wipe on Poly or Boiled Linseed Oil, most of them are very yellow in color. And if you think about it, yellow and red make orange, and I don't like my cherry to look orange. And it looks good over time. As the years go by, it helps cherry achieve a nice reddish-brown patina. Over the years, the best way that I've found to get matting and glass, or in this case plexiglass, for your picture frames is just to find a cheap picture frame on sale and just throw the picture frame away. I paid 20-something bucks for each of these picture frames, and for me to go buy the plexiglass and then have to cut it down, and then also to go buy the matting and cut it, it actually would have been more expensive to do it that way. So this is pre-cut, it goes real fast. And obviously this is going to depend on the size of the pictures that you're framing and what frames you can find on sale. So you'll just have to do a little shopping around and make the best decision for your framing project. One of the things I do not keep is the cardboard backing. I actually cut out a 1 8 inch piece of MDF or hardboard or plywood and I use that instead of the cardboard. And I use what are called glazing points to hold everything in place. These are originally designed to hold window panes into frames, uh, but they work great for picture frames. My local hardware store sells a box of 50 of these for like $1.39, so they're pretty cost effective too. And last but not least, I add the hanger. And I just use the hangers that have a sawtooth profile to them. After that, it was time to break out the measuring tape and level and hang these puppies up. I really like the way the through mortises turn out. I think they add a really elegant touch. And overall, for such a simple project, this really adds a nice punch to our dining room. And my boss, I mean my wife, really likes the way that they turned out. And that's really what this project was all about. Thanks for watching. Till next time.